Good morning. Our reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. Acts 21, 15. After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in uh, uh, with us to James, and all the elders were present. In greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they've been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Let us pray. Righteous Father, thank you for blessing us with our time together to worship you this morning. Thank you for this word that you've preserved from your servant Luke. We pray, Father, that you help us to discern your will in these things. Help us, Father, to conduct ourselves as Christians uh, in a way that fits your will, that is pleasing and acceptable before you. We pray, Father, uh, that we are always unified in the faith that we share in Jesus Christ, that we are always building each other up rather than tearing each other down, and that we are not placing divisions where you have placed none. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So this is, honestly, I think, the further along I get, uh, the, the further and further up my, my list of favorite passages today's reading moves. Uh, I mean, obviously it's all good, right? Uh, but this, is, this reading has a special place for me uh, because this story is about the unity of the church. And it's, I think, very clarifying when it comes to the unity of the church. So it brings some things full circle that we've started way, way earlier in the book. In fact, we've, all through the book of Acts, even from the very beginning, we've noted um, what, a, what a focus there is on the diversity of the church, how God is calling people from all different corners of the world, all different corners of life, all different cultures, calling them together in one church. That is the great sign of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, is that you have people from all over the world hearing the mighty works of God proclaimed to them in their own tongues. We saw that despite that great demonstration, the early church struggled to live up to that character Right? God had told them and had shown them through the Spirit what kind of group the church was to be. Not just one kind of people, but all kinds of people bound together in one faith in the body of Jesus Christ. But the early church struggled to live up to that, which led to this, what we sometimes call the Gentile question, or what we sometimes refer to as the Gentile debate. We've, earlier in the story of the church, there was this big question, must the Gentiles live like Jews in order to be saved? 
We go back to Acts 15. Uh, It was such a matter of great debate that they gathered a council in Jerusalem to consider this question because some of the brethren were teaching these newly minted Gentile converts that they did have to live like Jews in order to be good Christians, that they had to be circumcised, they had to circumcise their sons, they had to keep the dietary restrictions, all of it. You have to keep the customs of Moses if you want to be a good Christian. Um, And we saw how... The council handled that and ultimately remained true to the calling of the church by not binding the customs of Moses on the Gentiles. Well, now that whole matter has come around full circle. And now, today's reading, this story flips the question on its head. Must the Jews live like Gentiles to be good Christians? Is that what Paul has been teaching as he's been going around the lands of the Gentiles, proclaiming the gospel and converting people, both Jew and Gentile, to the Christian faith? And this is an important question for us. All questions of unity are important questions for us. But we shouldn't lose sight of our own... uh, Uh, The way way that we're implicated in this story, this isn't just a story about ancient Jews arguing about ancient Jewish things. We shouldn't dismiss it as something that's not directly applicable to us. We ought to pay close attention to this question ourselves because it touches on what we understand Paul to have been teaching all of this time. Uh, What do we understand him to mean in his epistles whenever we read them? Uh, Among them, especially Romans and Galatians that focus especially on this question of the Christian's relationship to the law. Do we think that Paul has been going around teaching that Christians must not keep the law? Because that's precisely what's at issue in today's reading. This is the way the elders of Jerusalem frame it. They have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. The brethren in Jerusalem have heard that Paul is teaching Jews elsewhere that to be good Christians they must live as Gentiles. And the elders in Jerusalem treat this as a misunderstanding of Paul's message. That's not what Paul has been teaching. And they offer a plan specifically to dispel this misunderstanding. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. And what does Paul think about all of this? Paul goes along with it. He has not taught anyone that Jews must live like Gentiles in order to be Christians. And this this plan that the elders come up with, that Paul goes along with, it clears up this misunderstanding in a very explicit way. Paul takes four men who are under a vow, but who are ready to complete their vow and shave their heads. He goes to the temple with them, purifies himself along with them so that they can enter the temple. They go in, and Paul gives notice in the temple as to when their days of purification will be completed and the offering presented for each one of them. The elders' plan also calls for Paul to pay their expenses which means to pay for the offerings that are, be, that are to be made on their behalf. All, right, all of this is in accordance with the law. And just so we understand clearly what this means, Paul is paying to have four men offer sacrifices in the temple. And assuming that this is a Nazarite vow, and that's the only vow that we read of in Scripture that includes the shaving of the head... Those sacrifices include a sin offering, as we read about in Numbers chapter 6. And this is all just the the elders of Jerusalem come up with this plan, presented to Paul. Paul goes along with it. 
Uh, we should also understand, by the way, these, these are Christians that we are talking about. Obviously the elders, obviously Paul. We're talking about all of them, these four that he takes into the temple to complete their vow. These are Christian men he's talking about. In fact, that's what this entire encounter is about, this entire discussion. The elders say, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. He's talking about Christians. And what he says of them, though, and this, this might unsettle us today, being primarily Gentile Christians uh, who have a, a certain view on the law, we'll say. The elders say they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. This entire matter is about Christians and what Paul allegedly has been telling Christians. And so the elders ask, what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. That is, the elders claim these men, these four that are going into the temple. So this question is not about non-believing Jews, about whether or not they should keep the law. Of course they're going to keep the law. The question is about... Jews who have believed in Jesus as the Son of God, that is, Christians. Now, I'm trying to express this whole situation in the most uncomfortable way I can think of, um, to make us confront the question that is posed by today's reading. We should remember, by the way, a similar discomfort that we might have experienced back in Acts chapter 16 when Paul took Timothy and circumcised him. We asked back then if Paul is going to spend all of his time writing against circumcision. I mean, especially you read through Galatians. In fact, well, we, we noted uh, back in Acts 16, Paul writes about circumcision in every one of his letters to the churches, except the letters to uh, the Thessalonica. And he writes about it to Titus as well. It's something that he's writing about constantly. Well, why then does Paul have Timothy circumcised? Right? And we said then that Paul's not uh, compromising his principles. We might be asking similar questions this morning of this story. If Paul spends so much of his time writing against keeping the law, then why does he go along with this plan in Jerusalem that has him keeping the law and helping other Christians keep the law, including the offering of a sin offering, and doing so publicly as a way to signal to all the Christians there that they may keep the law. And this is where we need to take care, because if we understand Paul's teaching, Paul's epistles, to be against keeping the law, then we have misunderstood Paul in exactly the same way that the people of Jerusalem have misunderstood him. That's what's at issue. They've all heard that you go around telling everybody to forsake Moses. And the whole scheme is to clear that up. So do we, along with those in Jerusalem, misunderstand Paul to be teaching everyone to forsake Moses? If we do, if that describes us, well, this demonstration in today's reading is for us just as much as it was for them in their day. And in fact, I suspect that's part of why the Spirit has chosen to record this for us and preserve it for us. Let us remember Paul's teaching more accurately. I think the problem is that we get a half understanding of Paul lodged in our heads. The teaching of the early church, the teaching of the apostles, is that the keeping, uh, keeping the customs of Moses is of no consequence one way or the other. It has no bearing on salvation. If a Christian does not wish to have his sons circumcised or to observe the dietary laws, fine. A Christian does not have to do those things. 
That was made clear in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. In Christ, those things are not bound on him. If a Christian does wish to circumcise his sons or to observe the dietary laws, that is also fine. In Christ, those things are not forbidden to him. They are truly and fully of no consequence. What Paul does teach against is keeping the law as though it were of consequence. Listen to what he says in Galatians chapter 5. I'll begin in verse 4. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. And so the problem in Galatia was not their observance of the law. The problem is their thinking that it had anything to do with their justification. They had, in essence, ignored what the Council of Jerusalem had told them. And they're thinking, no, we actually do have to be circumcised to be good Christians. Uh, we actually do have to keep the customs of Moses to be saved. That's what Paul is talking about when he accuses them of being justified by the law in Galatians 5. And again, if we return to Acts, we can see that the Jerusalem church understood all of this. It's baked into the council that they, uh, they have in Acts 15. If we turn to Acts 15, let me read from verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter, that is, whether the Gentiles have to live as Jews to be saved, whether they have to keep the customs of Moses. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the necks of the disciples that neither we nor, uh, sorry, but neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. All right, this, this council, which the elders refer to in today's reading, by the way, uh, this council refused to bind the law on Gentiles because they understood that salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, I want you to consider this. All right, Peter understands that the, the, the law as a means of justification is a yoke that they themselves could not bear, that their forefathers could not bear. Peter and the rest there in Jerusalem understood that, again, salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And yet they still, many of them, continued to keep the law. They did not see a contradiction in that. And we find the brethren in today's reading in Jerusalem keeping the customs of Moses in good faith. And we find Paul affirming their right to do so. Now, again, I said this is something that has a direct bearing on us, not that we're running around having a lot of debates about whether people can be circumcised or not, at least not that I've engaged in. Hope you all aren't. Um, there is a practical lesson for us to take from this. Because there's, there's a similar question for us. It, it, the Jews were, were asking, must Gentiles be like Jews to be saved? And then they were asking, well, do they expect us Jews to be like Gentiles to be saved? We engage in the same kind of questioning today. Must someone conduct themselves before God in exactly the same way we do? And I don't mean in matters of doctrine. Let us be clear about that. When God speaks on something, that's the way it is. Right? There's, there's no question about matters of doctrine. 
right? How the church is organized, what we do together when we're assembled for worship. Right? These are matters of doctrine where the apostles have told us how we're to act. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about matters of opinion, matters of liberty, right? what Paul calls, uh, if you're reading the King James in Romans 14, doubtful disputations. It's got some nice alliteration to it. Uh, if you're reading the ESV, Romans 14, he refers to them as opinions. Matters, by the way, that are overtly religious. We shouldn't miss this about Romans 14. Romans 14 is not about what's your favorite fast food, or what's your favorite color, or what's your favorite kind of music. Romans 14 covers overtly religious questions. Look in Romans 14, verse 6. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give th gives thanks to God. For no one lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. All right, we're talking about matters of our personal conduct before the Lord, our devotion to him. These, these are religious questions. Because right, not all religious questions touch on what we're doing in the worship assembly. Religion is, is bigger than just the worship assembly. But since these are matters of religion that we're talking about, we're going to be tempted to treat them all like they're matters of doctrine. Right, well, somebody's keeping some holiday that I don't like. Oh, uh, there. There's some shade of liberal. They are inching further towards exiting the true faith altogether. Right. Somebody does this, that, or the other thing in their personal devotion to God. I don't read about that. Just like some of the Jewish Christians once claimed that Gentiles must live like Jews, and just as some in today's reading think that Paul was teaching that Jews must live like Gentiles, it is tempting today to say, you must live like me in order to be saved. And by entering the temple in today's reading, Paul is displayed publicly for all that no, you don't have to live like me to be saved. And that is the shape of Christian unity. Right, we've got some Christians in the book of Acts who go into the temple on a regular basis, some who keep the Sabbath, some who keep the dietary laws, some who circumcise their sons, and we have a great many Christians who don't do any of those things. Are any of them not Christians on account of those things? And the book of Acts lays it out for us. These are Christians we're talking about. How many churches are there? We've got two different kinds of churches on display in this book. No, they're members of one church. Though their conduct might be different, they are brothers and sisters in one body, one Lord Jesus Christ, professing one faith in him. They share in one baptism. And this is the shape of Christian unity. Agreement in matters of doctrine, tolerance in matters of opinion. And the good sense, we hope and pray, not to confuse one for the other. It can be difficult to be faithful in both of these directions at the same time, but that's what's required of us. And so, again, let us pray for God's wisdom to live according to his will. We call on everyone this morning to obey this one faith that we have received from our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, through the prophets and the apostles. What we're talking about is good news. The Son of God came and lived among men to forgive you of your sins and grant you eternal life. All right, that's, and that's, that's something that we're facing down 
in an acute way this morning. Death has always been the problem. Everything else goes to the way. All the other problems that we have go to the wayside when we consider the problem of death. The good news of Jesus Christ is that he has conquered death because he did not just die for our sins, but was raised on the third day to new life, eternal life. We confess that he has ascended to the right hand of the Father Almighty where he lives and reigns to this day and that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We urge you to obey this good news because he extends his new life to you as well. Turn away from the life of sin. Confess Jesus as Lord. Be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. If you're subject to that invitation, won't you please come forward as together we stand and sing.